When you hear about climate change, it will usually be about replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy sources like solar and wind. And while that is absolutely at the core of this problem, it's not the only thing we need to consider. Picture this. You go to fill up your car and fly out to a family vacation in Mexico for two weeks. When you return, that energy is still readily available to you. Electricity is different. It is produced in an instant and is only available then. So throughout days, weeks, seasons, and years, there is always the need to balance availability and demand. And that makes it very clear that storage is a key consideration here. So research experts agree that storage technology is the key innovation and accelerator for our transition into a greener future over the next decade. Now, hydrogen is the part I want to talk about, even though there are many other great solutions, and they will undoubtedly work together. But when I say hydrogen, that might ring a bell. This is the part where you imagine a huge picture of Hindenburg and flames, but for copyright reasons, we don't have that, so just picture. <laughs> so there is something that comes up to mind. Hydrogen bombs are the next one. But this is more of an inherent characteristic than you might realize. See, energy storage is just effective. A lot of energy in as little mass or volume as possible. And if you release all of that in a short time frame, that's pretty much what a bomb is by definition. EV batteries are dangerous, natural gas mishandled, and you have huge fireballs. Hydrogen is not inherently more dangerous. It's just very good at its job, and so we need to handle it correctly. OK, we talked about this. Now let's get into the good part. Why do we care about hydrogen? First of all, it's a process called electrolysis. We use water and excess energy and transfer it into hydrogen to store it and oxygen. We breathe that every day, it's totally safe for us. And we can reverse that process at any point in time to set that energy free again. And in the perfect process, this is free of any greenhouse gas emissions. That's perfect, right? Let's take a step back here. Three considerations. First of all, you need to build a facility somehow, meaning bricks, steel, other metals have, of course, some emission attached to them. But more importantly, I said perfect process. And if there's one thing I can tell you as engineer and researcher, perfect doesn't exist here. OK, so what does that mean then? What is inefficient? First of all, we do create some greenhouse gases, just a matter of fact, it doesn't work out perfectly all the time. But more importantly, the part that I want to refer to today is hydrogen itself is actually an indirect greenhouse gas. This part is often forgotten about, as I said, indirect, but it's very important to consider. Without going too far into the nitty-gritty details, it has reactions in the atmosphere, really complicated ones, that influence our climate through other substances that would usually have a positive impact and keep other greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. So it is something we need to consider for this process. OK, Nichols, how big is that impact and how does it work? Let's get to the numbers in a second. Let's first of all talk about how it works. I have an analogy for you. Think of your body as our climate. Your exhaustion is climate change, and your heart rate is the level of temperature change. In this analogy, many greenhouse gases we consider, such as carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas we always refer to, or methane, natural gas for that matter, they work more like a sprint, long time frame, and they take all of that time to fully develop their impact. In the same graphic, hydrogen is more like a sprint. Short time frame, high impact, wears off quickly. So the good part about that is, in comparison to many other greenhouse gases, it should be better at least. But you also know, once you've been to the track, you can't just sprint all the time, right? There is a clear limit to this, and that's the first key takeaway. Hydrogen is great at what it's doing, but it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Yeah, for some goals, marathons might actually be better. Still, you're more exhausted at the end. We can all agree on that. OK, then, as I said, let's get back to the data part. Let's think about how big is that number. The bad news for I have for you today, I don't have a number. And no, neither does anybody, a definite number. We're still working on that. That is part of the active research right now. But, of course, we're trying, right? So how do we get there? 
As I said, data is the key point here. And you use basically the same analysis in your everyday life. When you buy a car, stove, or whatever, you will look at the data, the spec sheet in that case. Okay, for hydrogen, it's a bit more complicated. You can't just Google whatever you want and find the number. We have to dig a bit deeper. Those numbers are out there, but they are not easily accessible. People spend a lot of time searching for them. They are deeply hidden in some science journal where freaks like us work for months to find them. <laughs> and so we wanted to change this. And that's why the team and I have worked tirelessly over months to create one concise hydrogen emissions inventory. What that means is we took all the data we could find, put it in one spot, any site in the US that uses, produces, or processes hydrogen in any way is in there, at least if we found it. And we also attached some kind of emissions to it, meaning how much does it usually leak? Again, it's an indirect greenhouse gas. It will be there, and you need to handle it. OK, why is this so important? Let's think about the data set as a ground for discussion. And in this analogy, let's think about cookies. Great, I love it. So you want chocolate chip cookies, and you want the best one in the neighborhood. That's the easiest part, right? So you want to compare the chocolate chips. They are most important for the taste. So you bake two trays of cookies, and you compare them. But for some reason, you use two different recipes. How do you know which ones were the better ones? Sure, the chocolatey flavor, that's easy to trace back. The sweetness, hmm, already more difficult. The consistency, you have no clue. It's the same in science. The more variables we have, the harder it gets to trace back what was actually the key. Was it the technique we used to analyze the data? Was it the data? Or was it the technology we're actually researching? That's the innovation I'm talking about today. Just as hydrogen is an indirect greenhouse gas, the invention and innovation that we present is an inventory that is indirect. It enables the next generation of hydrogen research, and researchers for that matter, to be better and more exact. And I grant you that. It is not as sparkly as AI might be. It is not as sparkly as electricity once was, right? You're not going to go out here and think, man, the world is going to be different tomorrow because of hydrogen. But it's just as important because we are the foundation that others will build up on to make this better. OK, why do we care about this now? Why not 10 years back? Why not 10 years in the future? Why is this important now? Two things. First of all, think of how big oil and natural gas are right now. If we want to just replace a tiny fraction of that, hydrogen needs to grow exponentially over the next decade. Any invention we can come to now, any improvement we can find, has an enormous multiplier attached to it. Anything that we do right now, we don't have to change in the future with extra investment. Secondly, for the first time in our history, we are actually ahead of the curve. What I mean by that is nuclear power, oil and gas had huge upsides. So we used them instantly with great pleasure, and only now we realize how detrimental it is to our health and to our planet. And let me be very clear. Our climate does not allow another misstep of this dimension. We need to get it right this time. And right does not mean I want to be the prophet, or you should be. It's not about being right or wrong. It's about making an informed decision. It's about collaboration, understanding what we're using, where it's best, how it works together, and how we work together as a society with a worldwide problem that can only be tackled with worldwide teams. So to get back to my cookie analogy, to the beginning. The best part about research that I want to share with you today is the best part that you will also find in cookie baking, because it's actually sharing the results. Thank you.